Hi, everybody. I'm Agree. I'm Harrison. And this is Bottom Line Design. And today we've got a very special guest, uh, Brian Landers, who uh, has just an incredible backstory. Um, uh, and, you know, notable on that is uh, that he was the founding designer at Zapier. So, yeah, Brian, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you both. It's amazing. That was such a pro intro. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, you know, we're getting some practice in. Um, Brian, I actually really want to take it back to the very beginning. Ooh. I want to know what it was like working on the critically acclaimed TV show, Reba. Oh, <laughs> yeah. way back. Way back. It was amazing. So, yeah, it was the uh, music editor, for, for folks who don't know, music editor for the Reba McIntyre signal. Kind of back in a past life, it feels like, at this point. Um, yeah, that was, that was my music career. I went to college for music, actually. So I found myself doing film and TV music in Hollywood. And one of the, um, you know, one of the things I found myself doing was this, this role for you know, the Reba McIntyre sitcom. Funny side story, actually. My grandparents had a um, country music production company, and they actually did Whoa. an early show with Reba McIntyre, like years. I was probably five years old. And um, at one point, I got to go on set at the, the Reba sitcom, you know, all these decades later, and had her sign a photo of me as a five year old talking to her on stage. No way. She was just like, what? And now you're the music <laughs> editor for my show. It's amazing. <laughs> that is really, it was really sweet. Is is that how you got your start uh, in music? I guess you could say kind of. I mean, you know, I think I found music um, sort of on my own. My, my father had a guitar, you know, that it was a wedding gift, I think, it was sort of how it came into our house. And it was just in the basement, you know, for all the years I was growing up. And, you know, it'd be something my brother would kind of, you know, pick up and play with as a toy almost every once in a while. And when I was about 12, I sort of picked it up a little differently and i started figuring out i could write a song on the guitar you know just a couple of notes or whatever but yeah, it yeah. was like just the whole world opened up and i was like wow people write music first of all and then number two i can write music and that was it that was the the beginning of the end for sports for me too <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's i hear that so was that like was that your first act of creation no i think i had done you know, I'd mess around with like keyboards and, um, you know, just, you know, art stuff and, and things like that. So I, I kind of like knew I was, I was tuned into art before that, mm. but I didn't know anyone, you know, my parents didn't do, you know, any creative stuff. Um, I had an aunt that was a graphic designer, which I kind of figured out later. Um, when I was really young, we didn't, you know, talk about what our family did or whatever. So I didn't touch that, but um, otherwise there was no influence like in terms of art in my you know family and so it was just sort of not an option you know right but i think i always was i think it was always there and i was always gravitating toward you know creative projects and you know you'd have to do like something in elementary school like you'd make a movie or whatever kind of a project or something i would always just go to town <laughs> <laughs> you always did like the extra extra credit Yep. And then yep. it's always the same line from the teacher when you give extra credit during like something creative. They're like, if you put in as half as much work into this as you did your paper from last week, maybe you wouldn't yeah. be having a, 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 an F. It's like, there you can't go. you just support me here? A little, yeah. little insight into Harrison's background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. I almost like did not care about school up until high school. And I was like, ah, I should probably start giving a shit, you know? Uh, yeah then made the dean's list i was like nice. yeah 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 <laughs> wow. i mean the, the it's so funny what you're talking about too of like uh when your family doesn't really know what to do with your creativity you yes. know like i i remember when um i was like i must have been eight you know i i, I might i guess be be dating myself you know you can pick in what direction i am but like uh the the osmosis jones movie had just come out and the Cartoon Network um, uh, was doing a promotional push where they had like video games on their website, like flash games that you could play. Uh, funny enough, also, this was around the time that the JSON format was getting developed. Uh, for those of you like computer history nerds out there, Cartoon Network actually like played a seminal role in the creation of JSON. Yeah. <laughs> no idea. Yeah. Super That's weird, awesome. right? Someone called Figma. Yeah. Someone, <laughs> right. Someone called Figma. And, and like what ended up happening was like, uh, 
I really wanted like I was so inspired by the games that I was seeing on the Cartoon Network website that I really wanted to like program my own game. And there was no YouTube yet. You know, Google had barely indexed the web. Like no one really knew like, you know, where, where I grew up, like how these games got made. And so it was just kind of like got put on the shelf. Um, but then, yeah, just gradual acts of creation, you know, step by step. And suddenly you, you find this like lane where you can actually produce things that excite you. Right. Absolutely. I mean, this is, you know, not to like be too brownish or whatever, but like, I think one of Steve Jobs' early insights was that like, you can, like the world, every, every object, you know, this, this mug, this iPhone, like everything around us, is, you know, that's man-made is designed by somebody. And yeah. It could be you, like you could be the one designing that, which feels like so much power, right? Like, but it's very inspiring because it means you can influence the world. You can leave some sort of mark, you know, on the world after you've left it, you know? Um, yeah I find that very inspiring so once you get yeah. a little glimmer of that as, as a kid it's like you see the whole world differently and your perspective changes you know yeah you, you realize agree? that like yeah like, everyone everyone's a human everyone can do and I, I feel like that that almost happens like as you're coming out of your a- adolescent years for me like that's when i found my my creative spark was there a particular moment either from music or maybe you know, beginning to to start conversations with your aunt that's in graphic design. Like, what what was that singular moment where you're like, "Whoa, I may want to consider doing this the rest of my life." Interesting. It was definitely music first because it was you know finding um, finding you know uh, guitar, and then I found you know Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin and Jerry Garcia. So those were the kind of things that like you know made me think. I, I just like lived in that, and it was ha- a happy place to be. And I started writing songs and I started recording myself and, you know, that sort of fed on itself. In terms of design, honestly, it was later. It was, you know, I think I started coding around 1997. It was the year in between when I went from high school to college. Uh-huh. Um, I went to art school, too. So it was sort of, you know, the right kind of thing to be doing. But this was like, you know, dial-up internet days, too, by the way. So it's super slow and awful. Yeah. But I still was like... This like web thing's interesting and you know, there was barely CSS at that point. So like you're talking web design is like just, you know, HTML kind of like, you know, level basic stuff. You know, you can maybe change the background color and have some Shout animated out to list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that kind of vibe. But but it was already enough that I was like, okay, I can do I can design these web pages and then very fast, like, you know, maybe maybe a little bit like I'm trying to remember which it was like my artist friends needed websites. And so that was kind of my entry point into like, I was like a web designer, like a classic web designer, and then started making my own content management systems, like around that same summer, I learned PHP. And I think like WordPress hadn't been quite invented yet. It was like maybe the year or two later that it got really popularized. So I was making my own versions of that because it was very much out of necessity though. It was like, I didn't want some friend musician of mine calling me up on the weekend being like, Oh no, we have a show and the, the date change. We we update our <laughs> website. Like, hell no. <laughs> I don't want to be doing interesting. that. So like would you consider that the first instance of implementing customer feedback? Like Oh yeah. It, yeah. yeah. Fair Absolutely. Fair. Yeah, no, it was always designed for me because it came through art and through artists. These were like either visual artists like animators or, you know, painters or musicians it was always about serving their art and like their identity, you know? So it was right. always very um, centric to them. Cause you can't just like, I think you should be this. And they're like, I have a whole persona and an identity that you have to kind of honor. And that's what my you know audience wants. So you as a designer can't step in and just kind of override that. Like it, it doesn't work, you know? So yeah, it was very empathetic kind of right from the beginning because it was art based, you know? I mean, it's it's all interesting. It's also funny how you're saying it, right? Because like um what you're describing, the only thing that would make it different from an engineer, and I say this to myself as an engineer, right, is when the engineer does get that customer feedback of like, well, this is this is my identity, this is who I am. And it's like nineteen ninety seven, you know, uh I think the the stereotype of the engineer, which I certainly have fallen prey to and it accurately characterized me, is like the CSS does not allow you to express your identity like that. Like, <laughs> no, like, uh, no, uh, that's it's not technically possible for you to express yourself as you desire. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> you know, stonewalling versus like, here's it. Like the designer mindset is like, okay, this is what you need. Like, yeah. let me figure out how to, how to make that as possible as possible. Right. With, within the limitations of CSS and HTML. I would even say not even possible, but like, what's the best version of this, you know, like mm. what can excel at this? So like, you know, I would have, I would be very, I would be a creative partner for those, those friends that I was working for. Where we would, I did all kinds of things. So like, you know what you just said, right? Like, okay, CSS doesn't let you do that. Okay. What if we use images as the entire, like, what if we use yeah. handwritten fonts instead of um, HTML, what HTML can do? Cause there weren't, you know, enough web fonts at the time. Right. Um, you know what I mean? Like, so you kind of break the rules as much as you can to serve that like creativity. And in that process, you come up with innovation, you know, that, along the way. And it's, I don't know, it all serves that kind of, it's just fun to be honest, right? Like oh, that's, totally. People look at it and go like, wow, I didn't know you could do that. Or just like, hey, this artist looks cool, you know, like at a minimum, you know? Um, so to me, it was always about like, what's the, what's the best version of this that could exist? And how do we bring that into existence? And yeah, you do have to work with limitations, but you know, you can always push those boundaries. You can always be creative, you know? That's how I feel about it. Yeah. So when you were going into college did you bring on some of these accounts like or were you just like hey sorry like i'm going off to school now you got to find someone else oh no i i did that for years i mean honestly you know music was even through my you know when i was doing music professionally i always made the most money doing web development and design that was always like my kind of bread and butter um so i was like touring and recording playing banjo in nashville and I was doing websites and stuff on the side, you know? So you basically either... Da Vinci'd it. You worked for the military just to fund your art. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I didn't, I took like maybe like four corporate things, you know, like a dentist office and they were all just, you know, um, in my network, kind of someone, someone who, an artist who I worked with their, their parents needed some site or something, but I did very little corporate stuff. It felt very creative. So it was always, you know, within the realm of like the world I was in anyway. And it was just a different artistic expression. And the tech was just the means to that end, you know, mm. and it happened to make, you know, good side income or whatever, so that I didn't, I wasn't as reliant on doing gigs to, to um, pay the bills, which, you know, you live pretty lean as a, you know, 20 something year old, like early on. But even then it was like, you know, I think I, I think I needed that extra income to make it work. Cause it's, it's even harder nowadays when, you know, digital files are free. Digital content is free. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not even talking about AI stuff, by the way. Um, but just it's hard to be a musician these days. But but it was even back then. So, yeah, it was always a kind of... But I, I, I never, you know, never felt like, okay, I got to do this other stuff on the side. It was always really fun and sort of creative, which is why when the start thing kind of caught my attention and I went from music to that, the, the, the took as the focus. It felt very natural. It was very, mm. it didn't feel like I was abandoning something or had found it along the way. It was like, they were both kind of parallel tracks, you know? Yeah. I, I wanted to also just draw a little attention to that. Like just from like a very quick, you know, skim of, of your LinkedIn, it looks like one of the winningest career pivots of all time. That you you go straight, <laughs> straight from like you know you're you're uh, working you know uh, music and doing music uh, editor work for Reba McIntyre, which is already like like pretty decently into the Hollywood deep state at that point, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're like w working on a show for like a, a major network, and and then from there, just like this like swivel happens that then gets you in front of like folks like zapier pinterest um this is just we're talking like before you even joined zapier full time right like you're you were like freelancing as a designer for a bit right designer developer always designer developer yeah together. yeah yeah um i worked for a few startups in in la for a while before i moved to silicon valley because the startup thing was just too interesting um you know i dabbled with my own kind of things that, that i don't think i would even call startups now because i didn't raise any money. I didn't find a co-founder. They were just sort of side projects that could have been startups. Um, but yeah, it, it didn't, like I said, it didn't feel like a pivot. It was sort of like, it was like where my attention was drawn to. It's like, at some point I realized that this, this tech stuff that was happening was everything. Like 
there was no distinction between the rest of the world and tech almost like maybe yeah. it was like you could see that tech was going to sort of you know capture all of this other stuff and then it felt like like what i want is to have impact i want to i want to make a difference in the world i want to solve big problems you know that's what design really is is like problem solving right and communication and creativity so like my mind saw this like you know these startups and especially because they were very consumer centric early on like pinterest you yeah. mentioned um and, and yeah it was sort of my curiosity with tech that led me there so my friend uh, Yash was the first uh, engineer at Pinterest, which was how I kind of got in their orbit. Um, and I met him through, it was this really goofy, like, um, you know, GitHub project that was like a, uh, like an API scraper of like Flickr. If you all remember, I don't yeah, know, yeah, yeah. You know, talk about dating yourself, like <laughs> people I'm watching this probably don't even remember that, but it was like the first like image sharing thing that really, yeah. And they had this wonderful, like creative commons license and stuff. And, I had this theme park uh, company that I was running that could like, you could use Flickr images and YouTube videos to embed in the e-cards. Mm -hmm. And I met Yash because, you know, he had this library that was open source project and I found some bug or whatever and reported it. And then we kind of became friends and I, you know, went to San Jose to hang out with him before he joined Pinterest. And it just randomly happened that he, you know, got hired as that first engineer. And then, you know, watching that journey was just like the most mind blowing thing. Cause it was like the two founders and my friend, and then, you know, the next couple months or whatever go by. And then it's like, you know, the first five people join and I'm kind of hanging out there. And then I did some consulting work. Like I did the right, early um, right. transactional emails that, you know, like somebody's liked your pin or, you know, here's new pins that you'd like. Um, so I did all, all the coding and, and the design for those first emails from Pinterest. And then it was like 50 people. And then they took over, they broke down the wall and took over the whole Palo Alto building. And then they moved up to San Francisco because they outgrew that space. And, and then my brother, who's like not in tech at all, was like using Pinterest to save his recipes or whatever, you know? And that's oh, when I yeah. was like, this is like mainstream. This is like a, a really big deal. Like people in my life who are not into startups and stuff are like using the, this technology. And that was just really eye-opening for me it was like in terms of impact like i was saying i felt like that was more interesting than the music stuff like writing a score for you know a bravo tv show or something like that you know whoa so that was the moment you think when the walls got knocked down the building was being taken over and you maybe just sat there for a moment and you were like whoa this is mainstream this this may be like the start of my life in this world or like, was there something more specific than that moment? It was a series of things. I had a friend who wanted to do a startup in LA and told me that that was my first sort of opening to that whole thing. And then I worked at a um, startup uh, in LA, like I mentioned, it was called Shop It, like Shop It, you know? Um, it was like an e-commerce kind of a startup. So I had, I had some experience like in that world and was interested in it. But I had definitely never seen anything like Pinterest because it was like, it was not obvious that it was going to be what it became that early. You know, it was like, it was cool. And I loved the team and stuff. I love the founders, but it just wasn't obviously like, my mom's going to use this someday or whatever. You know right, what I mean? Right. So now that, all moms use happen, it. Was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know who uses it now. It's so funny. Like you watch the cycle of things and they IPO'd and I don't even oh, know. Yeah. I, mean, I, I still use it, to be honest, as a designer, I use it as a mood board. Like when, mm -hmm. when I'm doing a new logo or something, I always make a yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I actually like I wanted to ask also about like this this early moment where you're getting you're getting exposed to a bunch of things that it turns out are going to have a pretty formative role in how technology impacts people's lives. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it was a coincidence that you were able to connect with these teams that ended up building household brands before they were household names like pinterest and zap you mean yeah like it started with that that comment right yeah. to you know and it, yeah what i have the same question was it was it something that you kind of like just found yourself in or was it something that at a certain moment you were like kind of chasing after it's so interesting because like i think it's both you know like there's no way in hell that it's like designed right like i didn't master strategize like like i said i didn't even know pinterest or zapier was going to become a unicorn startup or whatever in fact like 
I mean, I think I think I knew um, Zapier was going to be just because it was such a great like business, like in terms of people paying and wanting the product. It just was less obvious because it was like very consumer, and it's just hard to see those. So I would say, um, no, honestly, it's like um, the biggest factors are probably like you know I was following my curiosity. Like I was that open source project was something I was using and. I was just kind of, you know, it's like, wow, this is like a, somebody out there in the world, like made this code and I can use it. Like, I was just like enamored by that idea of open source. And so wanted to get involved with that. And then specifically that API was what I needed for a project. That was just me. And then, you know, for Zapier, it was a cold email to the CTO, Brian Helmig. And, you know, it was like, um, hey, you know, this is my email. It's really funny. He sent it to me like not too long ago to be like, remember this? <laughs> Um, it was like, Hey, you code in Django. Cause he had a Django podcast. Um, and you are a musician. Me too. <laughs> like we should meet up. That was it. And how did you, so, how did you find out that he was a musician? I think he had mentioned it on his podcast. So like he had uh, one of the early Django podcasts. He only did a couple episodes. It's really funny, but he and Wade, the CEO of Zapier are both musicians. Wade plays saxophone and Brian plays bass and guitar and all kinds of other stuff. So. That was it. Like it's just straight up passion alignment and just being, you know, kind of like, you know, unafraid to just randomly like reach out. Sometimes no one they don't reply. Sometimes they do. And in this case, you know, the three of them, the three co-founders, were in Y Combinator at that moment, like when I pinged them. So oh, how wow. could you? There's no way you could call that design, right? Yeah. That is total serendipity. Um, I think it's just people like when you go to college, they always say you're going to meet the best, you, you know, your best friends there. And it's because everyone that's at that university or college or school, whatever, they were thinking along the same lines in high school mm -hmm. or beforehand, like you were. And it, it's what led them to that, that, that sphere of like, I'm going to think like this. I'm really interested in this world. And so for you, it was a, a matter of just following your curiosity reaching out and your curiosity just naturally led you to people that you were surrounding yourself with. I love That's beautiful. hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, it's wild to think that like, what are the chances that I would have all those traits and that like those founders would also, and that they, they, that there would be something of like, you know, potentially successful or whatever there, you know, something of value to give to the world. Like it just seems so random almost, you know, but but I was, you know, doing the Pinterest stuff around the same time. So it's like, I don't know. I mean, you know, part of this is also probably Silicon Valley. Like there's, you know, the fact that they were in YC, YC exists. It creates, you know, you all know, it creates this sort of serendipity, right? It's like, oh, totally. you know, sure. You, you create, you know, you, you, you end up in those rooms where there's potentially good, you know, other quality people and, and network and opportunity. But you have to be kind of ready for those opportunities. Like you had to, you all had to be, you know, the engineering, design, like all those things for new me that you had to kind of, you know, see to triangulate what this idea could be. And, you know, it's just, it's so wild. It's like the create your own luck thing, right? Like it's not sufficient to do either one. You can't just go to Silicon Valley and pop into a tech and like all of a sudden. <laughs> and just like sit. Like, yeah. Maybe yeah. in 2010. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even then, because that's just, so, you know, with the Zapier crew, you know, he maybe was interested enough to reply to the email, but like the fact was I had all those skills of web design and whatever, like, and they desperately needed that help. Like they had no templating within their, um, you know, their, their like landing pages for all the earlier Zapier pages. They didn't even have a footer on the website. The logo was this wow. ugly mess that, you know, they had designed themselves with like a, you know, $12 font or whatever, you know, like. It was just, um, they really were in need of the exact skill set that I had. And it was like a perfect match. You know what I mean? So did you yeah, reach out you know, as a designer or more as a developer or kind of somewhere in the middle? It was just what I said. It was like, I'm a musician and a, a, a engineer. And, you know, I, you know, I don't even, it, well, there was no proving. I wasn't like, here's my portfolio and whatever. Like, it was just like, I didn't even know who they were. Like, remember they, they weren't, they hadn't even announced Zapier yet. So he was just some dude on the internet or whatever, right? <laughs> and I like wow. his podcast. That's it, you know? So, okay, this this just makes me curious. Like, what, what you're describing makes me really, like, want to know, what are the criteria that draw you to a person? Because it seems like you get drawn to the right kinds of people 
for what you're trying to accomplish in your life and your goals. Yeah, interesting. I'm thinking of this like on the spot. So, you know, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, great grain of salt on my, my first an version of this answer. But my student first draft of this answer would be, I think that like, um, I have a really high quality bar. Like I just, um, I love people who care, like who sweat the details, which you could appreciate as a designer, right? Like that's kind of our job. Um, but that could be in terms of communication. That could be in terms of like, you know, you're an engineer and it's how you code or how you um, approach your projects or something. There's a lot of ways you can express quality, but that's a big kind of um, bias I have, right? Like I tend to be a little dismissive of folks who don't have that, <laughs> which is the flip side of it. Um, I've gotten more patient with that over time. And I think everyone has something to contribute, but like in terms of finding greatness, like, you know, you, you, you look for that quality. So for instance, those Zapier founders, like I said, I knew right away that they were onto something because the quality of the idea, the way that they're working with customers, like the fact that their first customers paid, you know, like, but not only oh, that, yeah. but like the, the quality of the code and like the way, like they had already done the, um, the brilliant landing page SEO trick where they, um, they created, before they even had the integrations ready, they coded up pages dynamically that had, you know, app A to app B so that when you search for, you know, MailChimp to QuickBooks or whatever in your, in your, in Google, they would come up as like a top three result, even That's though like, they didn't wow. have those integrations. Yet. Crazy. And, so, and then, that, then you just build to that demand because you know, people are looking and it's very high signal, right? Because why do you randomly you, type in MailChimp? That's to, when you know your customer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And. I mean, that's like, like that was, that ended up being like the thing, right? That their, their marketing effort and their go-to-market motion is very well known for is just that they have like a factorial number of possible like uh, app integrations that they can do. And so you're telling me that like yeah. before they even had a product, they had built out that templating engine to like auto-generate those pages. 100%. Yeah. They, they knew even, they called it like the hub and spoke model. I mean, this is why they, you know, got funding a demo day at YC too, is because like, they saw that future of, you know, every time you add another app on, on the integration platform, it would add exponential value because not only can you connect it to app A, but now you can connect it to app A, app B, and app C. Maybe, you know, in every case, it doesn't, you, maybe you don't want to connect those apps in that particular way or whatever, but all in all, like, it's pretty true. So like now there's 5,000 plus apps on, on this platform so that you can almost do anything you could think of, you know what I mean? So anytime there's a, missing native integration on a, a particular SaaS, you know, platform, Zapier is what they promote essentially to like fill in that gap, right? Because it's just, you know, so ubiquitous almost, you know? And yeah, they, they saw all that from, from the very first, you know, beginning of the project. So, I so know that's, that's a, um, that's a, that's a, when you see people like thinking ahead that far and it looks right, it's worth taking a risk to kind of, you know, get yourself involved with that, that sort of a thing, whether it's investing in them in some way, if you have even a couple thousand bucks to like spare a thousand bucks even, or, you know, um, working with them so that you can be a part of that story or straight up, you know, join them as a co-founder. Like there's all these ways you can kind of get involved, but whenever you see that, like you can definitely get in there somehow would be my advice. Yeah. So, so where was Zap your app when you got in there? Like, I, I know you just described, it. like, yeah, like, it's like Y Combinator. Okay, like, what, where was the product at? You said it, like, it sounds like it wasn't quite live when you discovered it. What was it like when you joined? Like, where, where was it? They, they had a couple integrations live. I don't remember how many, you know, I, I can't remember. I remember we built the first, like, 100 on one of our retreats or whatever. So, like, it was, it was less than that. But um, it was kind of a train wreck, <laughs> product design-wise, <laughs> like, they knew what it was. It was integrations. It was APIs. And then you wrap the endpoints so that, you know, uh, less technical users can like figure out how to connect those up with triggers and actions to kind of if this and then that happens or whatever. Um, they had all that. They, they knew what it was, but it wasn't like organized. There was no style guide that kind of ties all together. The, the structure of the site wasn't really together. So it was like they had the important things, but like none of the, the polish that you, you want to mm. kind of see to make it, you know, have legs essentially. So, yeah, it was, it was really fun because there was a lot of low hanging fruit, you know, like just straight up like navigation on the site to get people to like the right pages or whatever was, was like an opportunity, you know. 
But um, but still, like that customer demand and, and knowing that like if they get this right, they will have an audience in the business, you know. So like even as ugly, you know, early as it was, like it was clear that like something could was there, you know. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. So you it, you went you emailed uh, Zapier before they were like the cool kids on the block. And then tell us what was that first like signature project that you were working on? With them? Uh, yeah. It was, you know, I remember like, I think that the, the thing that they were kind of like, you got to come do this was like, like templates. So it was built in Django. Remember that was why we, I connected with them. Um, and they needed like help with just straight up like the, the CSS and like the templates for each page and how should the pages be designed? I mean, we're talking like basic, you know, web design stuff almost, you know, but like, cause like I said, they, they had a lot of the back end stuff working, but like navigation, you know, like the structure of the pages, you know, how do you communicate to customers? Like, so for instance, when you hit those landing pages, I described earlier, what do you see? Like, we know we have to show you app A and app B, but like, what is that? And so like, that was, you know, the kind of like app A plus app B or whatever thing, like, yeah, you know, right. which was a, it's so funny. I was chatting. <laughs> Right. Like so that was like an early, you know, that was something that we hadn't seen before because there weren't all these other integrations platforms or collabs and things happening with brands, you know. So, yeah, it was it was that it was just kind of, you know, it was like design SOS, you know. <laughs> Help that. us. You know? <laughs> Triple yeah. tap on your watch. Yeah, yeah, right. Like <laughs> yeah. Johnny Ive, send Johnny Ive. <laughs> send Johnny Ive. Yeah. <laughs> send Alan <laughs> Die. <laughs> okay. That's that's very cool. And when when was the first time I'm assuming, and maybe this happened in your Pinterest consulting days, but when was the first time that you talked to a customer for a product that you were working on outside of the the artist that was telling you the that, art stuff? Yeah. Yeah. It was at that first startup. So um, the, the shopping, the e-commerce one I mentioned, you know, because we, we were, you know, I was starting to kind of get that product design kind of settled because I, I started as like a design marketer. I was doing like, we were on Flash earlier, like Flash and things like that. There were little games, like you could play on the site, um, just, you know, building out like functionality and stuff. But then I kind of quickly you know, surfaced as someone who could kind of help with the strategy of the product. and. And to me, that was always tied to the customer. So it's like, what do people need? Like, it's not just, you're not just sitting in a room for fun, like thinking of random things. Like, I mean, you could, you could do that, but that's just art, I guess, right? But like, for a product, like if you have users, they have desire and needs and your job is to like lay those train tracks down so they can take that action. And then if you, if you do that well enough and you kind of grow with your you know, audience and their demand, you have something, you've got some kind of a business or, you know, something with traction, you know what I mean? So they were always very, uh, like well linked in my, in my brain. And so that becomes like a superpower by the way, cause like people want the outcome. They want your, your, you want your audience to like what you're building. So they keep using it. Like everyone wants that same thing, but if you don't kind of have that sort of compass to like your user, it looks like magic. It's like, like, wow, like, you know, this product person figured out that, like, you could build this feature and then all of a sudden usage doubles or whatever. Like, you know, it's a very desirable sort of, um, you know, skill set and sort of process and function, you know? So shout Is out there... to all the product designers out there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> seriously. Well, you're on the right channel. Um, where was it when you saw your work actually, like, have a re you're, you're just talking about this moment where you're like holy cow just like doubled like you know user growth or like retention or whatever did you have a specific moment where your work literally did that yeah there was one at zapier i wish i could remember wade wade always remembers i'm i'm bad at like um like dates and things in the past like i kind of always just look forward is sort of my jam mm, <laughs> um, okay so it, it, like whenever someone's like remember when whatever i'm like eh, kind of but I do remember that there was like some early templating stuff that happened at Zapier where it was like the footer and maybe some, it was a navig, it was, it was information architecture kind of a thing that like, think about it. If, if you can't navigate through a website, there's no discovery. You maybe will land there from SEO and do that one thing you need, but you won't find anything else. You know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. why that's like a whole field. It's like information architecture is like, what, what do you put in that 
top navigation, how do you guide people toward somewhere where they w- would increase retention or usage? You know what I mean? And it did it like doubled the, the, the like traction on the site. I- I'll have to get back to you on like the exact numbers or whatever. We'll, we'll sure. do that. We'll do an um, insert TikTok here or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Right. Right. Wow. Okay. And so, uh, tell us in about like, you know, um, what the successive phases were that you were there for in Zapier's journey, you know, so you, you get there, it's design SOS. And then what are the chapters that come after? Chapters that came after were, it, that's kind of what was cool about it was like executing for that vision that they already had, you know, it's like kind of new, like, okay, if we get enough of these apps, like onto this platform, it will touch, it will touch on, you know? Um, so it was always a matter of getting more integrations, right? Because that's the whole you know, public spoke model, like you know, adding value, like a network. Every node gets added as exponential value to the whole network, right? right? Um, that was that. And then there was a lot of other kind of marketing things. Like I remember making, we had like an engineering blog and then a marketing blog for technical users. Um, so there was a lot of content creation that was kind of clearly valuable early on. Because um, you have to educate folks. Like, there, you know, people aren't just for fun. Maybe, maybe they are now with AI, but like, people don't just like. There's a very few amount of people who are like into like efficiency, and everyone else just just like run around with their hair on fire trying to get their job done. You know? Yeah. And they'll yeah buy a pail of water, right? You know, that's the kind of you know typical mode most people are in. So, yeah, educating people about what opportunities there were for automation was something that had to be like you know like educate the market kind of a thing. You know, um, so that was a big part of it was, you know, like the sort of content marketing side of it. Um, but after that, you know, it was pretty easy sailing. It was like, okay, the, the, the back end was like a big thing. It's like, you know, anyone who, who's familiar with APIs knows that they, they fail. Like they have terrible error messages. <laughs> yeah. um, and trying to represent all that to a non-technical user is like, Talk about fun design challenges, by the way. That was like the supreme one. It was like, how do you take a 503 server error or whatever and communicate that to a non-technical user at scale with a thousand, you know what I mean? Um, and it's yeah. always the errors involved. in these APIs that like come off as so frightening. Right. That it's like 501 exclamation point, dark red border, <laughs> dark red background. <laughs> Like bold yeah. white, like you know, sixty four point. It's like, it's like yo, four oh seven error. Client sucks. Four oh nine error. You should feel bad about yourself. And you're like, as like the designer at Zapier, it's like, I don't know if we can tell like a, a marketing person at like a, a dentist's office that they should feel bad about themselves. Shut for, your laptop. Exactly. Yeah. Shut your laptop off. Underscore yeah. now. Like, yeah, totally. Like, you and I, I was thinking about that actually even before this call. Is like. I, I feel like the work that you guys did at Zapier was part of like almost like training wheels for people who didn't directly interface with um with like the server as as uh, mm. almost like a coworker, right? And so like there's been all this education that I think that people ambiently have now, right? Um that they didn't like a decade ago. And I actually think that Zapier deserves like a pretty good slab of credit for you know, connecting non-technical audiences with, okay, you need to get something done and you don't want to like hire somebody to do this data entry job or like, you know, whatever. You probably just need to describe it with something like Zapier. But then that requires some degree of knowledge about like the errors and authentication and all these other things. Like, was this like part of your guys's like master plan in that, in that like, you know, first couple chapters? 100%. Yeah. I mean, it's, it makes me very proud to think of that. That's what these founders had figured out, you know, like, and, you know, I told you I met them because I was in my love of API. So I was like, oh, yeah, you're like, by the way, Zapier is like API in the name. That's why it's, that's why it's not two P's, which it probably should be because like Zapier makes you happy. You're like, well, I it's two P's, guys. <laughs> um, Whoa. That's okay. like that, I'm kind of that, having yeah. my mind blown right now because it's very much along the lines of like FedEx has I'm, some I'm, air- <laughs> Yeah, well, really? I'll get you to it. Yeah, yeah. I had to get Fe- away from the mic because I was thinking the same thing. FedEx has an arrow in it, you know, yep. so it's like moving forward. This. And uh, I remember telling my friend that just the other week. And uh, he was like, what the fuck? 
Yeah. And then he texted the me. He texted space. me like a couple days ago. He's like, "Dude, I just saw it. I just saw it on a truck. Like, can't unsee." <laughs> and so now I'm looking at the Zapier, or I'm thinking about the logo right now. I'm like, "API." Wow, that's that's all yeah. I see now. And the, you know, the original slogan was like, "We're just a bunch of humans," which is very Midwest, by the way. It's very humble, like shucks. Like, we're just a bunch of humans who want computers to do more work. Was like the original kind of slogan. I think it still kind of guides the the sort of you know, mission and, and, you know, what it's, it's a lot more mature now, right. And, you know, it's a business that makes, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year or whatever, but it's like, you know, it's the same thing. And, and that's, I think, by the way, to like talk, you know, bring up AI, like AI and automation are kind of merging in, in, I think most people's brains, like, I think people look to AI to kind of take on tasks for them right now that might be content generation. Um, but, it, you know, but a lot of like early startups are kind of playing with, more workflow kinds of things. So like, um, a ticket or, you know, or, you know, do this copy paste data entry thing that you're, you're mentioning before, you know? Um, so I think like in a funny way, it's a huge opportunity for Zapier to kind of, you know, be a core part of that because they have just as much data as anybody in terms of what works for automation. And the only new thing is the, the natural language piece on top, right? It's like, how do you go from natural language yeah. and describing what they want to the, API complexity that we were just talking about, which is pretty burly, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's also, that's crazy to think about. So is that, I mean, like something that you see as like a new frontier for, for Zapier to tap into is like, there is, there's work, you know, like people literally like a small economy is formed around like people who basically sell their services of all figure out how to wire up your Zapier connections for you. Right. Like, is this something that like you think is like, in that opportunity space of like have almost like a, a series of prompts that you can give an AI who then will be like, Oh, okay. You're trying to make it so that when you get a form submission in, in Webflow, that it gets, you know, that contact gets added to this like mailing list on MailChimp. And then it just Absolutely. like pops out. Yeah, you got it. I mean, that's the dream, right? That's what everyone wants. No one wants to do those tasks, right? I mean, like, it, it's like, you know, why do I even need to be there pushing those buttons or whatever if I can tell you, it's, it's a bit like the model that kind of works a lot UX wise is like training a virtual assistant, right? Like as, as a yeah. human, human, it's a similar kind of a vibe. Like you could almost anything you ask is actually to do. You could ask another human. They might need to be an engineer to, to pull off some of it. But by the way, right. like, you know, GPT-4 writes code really well. So like you can imagine like that's what's happening under the, under the hood, right? Is like, you know, code is being written to fulfill these natural language requests. But honestly, like to, to back to the Zapier opportunity thing, keep it simple. Like, like we talked about, like lowering that bar for people to be able to achieve like anything that tech can do, but not being technical yourself. That's the promise right. of, of AI, right? I mean, that's sort of yeah. it right there. And that's Zapier's earliest, you know, mission statement, essentially. And so, so. Where was the company when you were ready or, or you, you moved on to your next chapter? Yeah, I was um, really itching to do my own startup. That's why I turned down, you know, being employee number two at Pinterest. Um, you know, it's why I took, uh, actually, shout out to um, the, the first official, like, design employee at Zapier was a guy named Al Abud. Um, great designer. I mean, we kind of overlapped a little bit, but it was sort of like I resisted joining for like a year, maybe a year and because I was trying to do my own startup. Um, and they were like, we're going to hire someone full time. You're going to come or are we going to hire someone else? And I was saying, no, no, no. So I was consulting during all those early days, trying to do my own startup on the side. So when I finally joined, I think I was, I don't remember what number employee I was, but I remember I was a third guy because I was already like third guy with a Y. It was like confusing to like call it. So I was B3, like third, the third guy. Is what I gave myself a nickname. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. So, but I think when I left, it was probably a year later because I still wanted to go. I remember applying to YC with another, you know, co-founder uh, for something. It was it was like a year later, and I think it was maybe fifteen people, something like that, when I left. Um, wow. So, was, so I, even though I had been working in Zapier for like over two years or maybe more, um, I had only been working there for for one year total. So that's okay, kind of the, okay. The early story with me there. So okay, so you're yeah, like um, you're there. Uh, you you leave uh, around the time there. Are Fifteen people. Um, 
it sounds like pretty well on their way to to figuring out you know the things that they figured out now um what what comes after zapier yeah and i have to finish one last thought there because like oh uh, please yeah 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 it up but like the problem i was working on when i left which we had gotten made progress on but hadn't figured out was going beyond one trigger to one action so if this then that it was like if this then that then that then that right like that had not been done and there was a lot of worry internally about complexity leap because for not technical folks that's a big deal like in getting into yeah. filtering and pads and logic and mm -hmm. you know it's like it, it was a really big kind of design challenge that i was just loving so i had all these had all these fun metaphors i remember like flying to the retreat you know one of our retreats and like seeing that apple had just come out with like a lot of the um iphone apps like early iphone apps and they were like, one of them was like a guitar thing where you had the guitar pedals inside. Of it. And I saw that, like, you know, the pedal board. And, and I'm a musician, right? So I was like, that's the metaphor. It's like you, you have inputs and you have outputs and you have a bunch of little fiddly knobs, like, on, on within that kind of box, right? But it obscures right. the complexity of, like, the circuitry and the power flow and all this stuff that's going on inside. And that was kind of my guiding metaphor for, like, okay, that's what APIs are. That's what apps, you know, are essentially is like, you know, you, you take inputs and outputs and then you kind of do something with them in the middle that adds value, but hopefully you obscure the complexity enough for, for end users such that they're having fun just kind of fiddling with, with knobs and pedals and stuff, you know? Does that make any sense? I don't even know. Are, like yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> RIP GarageBand, by the way, but yeah. shout yeah. out to Skewmorphism in its best form. Truly. You know? <laughs> I yep. think, like, it definitely took the cake for, yeah, like, hyper-realistic, but not. Um, was there, I, I kind of want to, like, go somewhere else with this conversation. I want to talk about, like, role, role models, and I want to talk about uh, people that led you where they they understood the roi of design like who sticks out in your mind from your past wow um i'll be honest it's been it's it could be a battle i don't know if, i don't know if you all were designing i'm trying to remember when there was an inflection point i think it was kind of maybe after airbnb when there were like two design co-founders of a uniform or whatever like there was not a lot of love. Do you remember like Google had to do like a whole thing where it was like, no, we value design. And, like, yeah. So, you know, yeah. Mateus in, Duarte. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Before, yeah. before, you know, maybe like a couple of years before that, like design was kind of like a little bit undervalued. You know, it was sort of seen as this thing that you count on. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's like the Craigslist. You brought up Craigslist earlier. It's like, hey, Craigslist has been the same for all these years and it's got bazillions of users. Like, maybe design doesn't matter you know what i mean and like airbnb it, it took, insert <laughs> well it, it took a little while to get to the point where like now everything's beautiful and the bar for a consumer thing is like so high and we've got the iphone and we've got nest thermostat we've got whatever like now people totally. expect greatness even from like the geekiest you know device companies or whatever you know um but before that was not the case and things were pretty ugly <laughs> in the world um yeah do you, do you remember that do you know what i'm talking about i mean uh, i yeah. totally remember you know honestly i think that that shift happened this is kind of like i remember this moment happening where i opened up my my macbook and i noticed that the display went on after maybe like a quarter inch and i bent down and i was like no way and then i closed it and i noticed that it automatically just closed and i was like those are magnets. Oh, Those are magnets nice. in there. And it, I don't think that it was actually the launch of the iPhone in 2008 that really like set people off. I think it was around like 2012 when that MacBook came out. Yeah. It shrunk down the laptop size almost by half. It shrunk mm -hmm. the weight down almost by half. It's probably like the biggest leap in industrial design I've ever seen. And I think that people... It, since the product was so ubiquitous, I think people naturally came to expect other products to be that well considered, and they weren't. Companies were playing catch up, like day yes. after day after day, and suddenly these Fortune 500 companies they were all design thoughtful or maybe design curious, right? Yeah. Because now you have like a three trillion dollar cap company called Apple, and it is design led. 
you know, under operations, but like still design led. Of course, <laughs> of course. You got it. And by the way, like, so Pinterest stands out. Ben Silverman of Pinterest and other, you know, co-founders. Um, and then Shark was, you know, early there. Like they, they, they saw it. Like we, you know, talk about sweating the details. Like, remember I told you about those HTML emails I made? We did stuff like um, to simulate the drop shadow, which was oh, yeah. which was a CSS thing, but it, it's not available. I don't even you think to this day. It. Yeah, because HTML email is like archaic. It's like straight yeah, up yeah. tables and, and stuff. So I I like went in there with the the eye drop, you know, the color picker in Photoshop, and figured out what each of the pixels were of the drop shadow and simulated them with the background color of a table. And they they want they like they were. I mean, I think I initiated that, but they were like, "Hell yes, this is this is the kind of quality we want," you know. That was the kind <laughs> or of manic thing that, behavior. Yeah, I mean, attention to detail, bit. manic behavior. Yeah, people, yeah. People appreciate that stuff. I really think like totally. it adds up. It, it creates, and I think we all, you know, people know that because of Apple probably, you know, standing alone early on. But like, it, it increases trust. It increases the feel, like the the joy you experience when using these things, whether it's software or like a device or something like it really changes like your emotional connection to it, which is a big component of these things, you know? That's why. Yeah, I'm a yeah. Too, so, you know. No, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I mean, like, you know, that question you're asking of like, what what do you think, it, like, was that inflection point? Um, what happened? Uh, I've been thinking a lot about basically two things recently, because I've also been trying to put my finger on it. Why is it that this feels like it's a real thing in a way that like a couple decades ago or like 15 years ago, it wasn't. It was seen almost as like um, uh, like the pinky finger of the marketing department, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. Right. Yep. Uh, and here's what I, like the closest I've been able to identify it is like that Apple is in a very strange and unique position where at least as far as uh, digital, like the digital world goes or the compute world goes, they're essentially like the company that, that almost invented the notion of, of caring about that stuff. And so everything just kind of like followed in their wake because of how much of a tear they left. That They said, if computers could be ergonomic, if compute could be ergonomic, you have no idea the kind of power that could get unlocked, right? And that's fundamentally a design problem. Um, and so everyone, I think, when they're doing product design, when it comes to digital products, is essentially just following in those footsteps. And thank goodness that they're, they're at $3 trillion and haven't stopped yet. Because it's, it's sort of like, you know, uh, room that, you know, somewhere anyone could get. So, yeah, that's the first thing. Um, the second is, is something I would love to hear your take on, Brian. You know that um, Mark Andreessen essay, Software is Eating the World? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like kind of an iconic essay uh, for those who, who may not know it, uh, who are listening in like 2011. Andreessen gets uh, a New York Times uh, sort of guest op ed or, or something like this. And he basically argues that software is going to just envelop everything and it will be coordinating all spheres of human life and economic activity, which a decade in looks like so far to be quite true. Now, Brian, not here's... to be confused with this time to build essay. <laughs> yeah, not to be confused with time to build. Uh, <laughs> yeah, also also a classic. But Brian, here's a corollary that I noticed from that. If software is eating the world, who's going to design all these new interfaces? We are, right? And, and, right? and a whole army of designers at Noom, I would assume. <laughs> <Just a free laughs> yeah, plug. the guild. Yeah, the free, guild plug, right? free plug, right? No, I mean, yeah. you know, I think you're right. And by the way, we are at a whole new paradigm um, like of, of UX and UI with AI because it's a, just a different way. Having a computer that reasons is a very new kind of shift um, in the way that we interact with it. Like, which the one advantage we have in this shift is that it feels very human. Like chat, you know, that's chat GPT kind of is the first thing that's sort of taking off, right? Probably because of, you know, how good the results are. But like also that form factor, like is just so natural because Every single person out there who has access to a you know device does WhatsApp or Facebook or uh, text messages or whatever, right? Like, so we we kind of know you know like inherently like how that interaction should go. It doesn't stop there though, because like for instance, when you're working with things like Zapier, like at some point like you're playing like 50 questions with the AI, and it's like, should I turn down the knob like <laughs> one amount? And it's like, no, just give me the knob and I'll I'll turn it myself, you know. So, and, and other things like conveniences, like discovery is really rough through um, chat. Like, so for instance, if there's 50 things I can do and I don't know what I, can, what I want to do, 
it, it's going to be really hard to discover that through 100% text in the chat sort of, you know, user experience. So mm. I think there's that was a huge, j just a small insert. Do you guys remember when Siri first came out? There was like no usage. Really, nothing's changed. Mm. But like, there was no usage early on, and <laughs> hey, like they had, they had like five year, yeah, they had like a yeah. five year lead. They dropped the ball like straight up. Um, but it was really, really interesting because when you said, uh, "Hey, S," um, or you uh, held the power button, it would give a list of prompts, and that was yeah. on its like second or third version, and it gave a list of prompts. And I remember seeing that and being like. I had no idea it could do that. I had no yep. idea it could do that. I had no idea it could do that. And I think that's probably the biggest roadblock to most technology, actually. Yeah. It's not just like AI. It's not just like voice. It's understanding capabilities, yeah. making capabilities accessible. Like, how do you find the shift in design making features more accessible? Like, just the other day, I would consider myself a huge Apple fanboy shamelessly but i just learned that you can long press this is a super niche feature you can long press on text in your messages and then tap other ones and it all comes into a group you then move the app and then you can just like drop it into another conversation like a copy so, paste kind of a thing yes but yeah, like a and, group copy paste yeah. and then there's this other feature that i learned the other day where you can literally go from your iphone and like some type of mixture of gestures and then minority report it right onto your iPad by like expanding yeah. and it drops the image. In. Yeah. And I'm like, if a hundred thousand people in places of authority knew about these features, what would the GDP equivalent be of that? <laughs> you <Yeah. know>? like, <laughs> like, a lot. So yeah, I, I'd be curious to hear your, your thoughts on like, yeah, how, do, how can design be made more accessible uh, in the future? I mean, the, the, the fast answer to this is, is user research, you know, customer development and user research, because watching the user struggle with your product is like the most eye-opening experience and empathy building that you can have as a designer. I think we, as designers, grossly appreciate that there are whole, you know, maybe, I don't even know if it's the majority of people who, who need to like react to something in order to like, you know, make something happen. So in other words, if you just say, what do you want? Big blank open prompt. They'll be like, oh, like, I'm not sure. Like, maybe I had one thing I wanted to do and I already got it. You know what I mean? But they need to see a menu or see an example of something. And then they can yeah. take that and, and make it their own and really run with it. But um, that's just one example of a type of person. Some people, you know, just straight up want to copy the template and just hit go and have that work for them or whatever, you know? But But when you're designing a product, you're inside it, right? Like, you're, you're dreaming up this perfect plan for people to go down just to make the train tracks exist, right? But very rarely are the people on the other side of that, like understanding that or knowing where to go with the train tracks. And every single person is different. So like, even if you design it such that it works for, you know, some group of people, it's not going to work for someone else. Like maybe, maybe someone is very visual and they don't like reading or something. Like if you have mm -hmm. a wall of text that explains like what those features are that you're talking about, Harrison, like, that might not even click for them. They might just be like, peace out. Totally. Like, I, the wall of text, I'm not reading that. Like, that's probably most people, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, I think it's largely the reason why, like, they got rid of it is because they found that people weren't reading it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they, they made this trade off assumption, which I think was totally wrong, which was you can ask Siri anything. But the fact of the matter is, is like, you can ask Google anything now. Like it's, it's just natural, natural language. Like NLPs are very, very tricky animals because you, you both know that they are wildly powerful and both wild, like commensurately wildly inaccessible. You don't know their whole, the, the whole breadth of power, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's very true. Well, think about this. Remember I was telling you like the paradigm is pretty close to like human interaction. Same thing. Like I meet you agree. And I'm like, I don't know what this human's capable of. I don't know what his background is and what he <laughs> loves and how we connect as, as two individuals and what we could do together to collaborate. Like all that stuff applies. And like, you know, how do we do it as humans? Maybe this is a good like thing we should explore as designers or whatever, but like we probably like shoot the shit, right? Like we just kind of communicate and talk and, and go in different angles and 
explore what seems interesting to us, like, you know, together or whatever. And at some point we kind of, you know, learn enough about each other and have enough context to like take action on it. Like we're going to do a project together or we're doing this podcast together. Right. Um, maybe there's some corollary to that, like with, with, you know, with functionality, like within products, you know, maybe that's a good outcome. It's probably not a literal one-to-one kind of a conversion, but. Right. Right. I mean, I, I've been like it, it, this is like open question in my mind also about like how much AI is going to be able to bring a layer of structure to previously like pretty unstructured collaboration. There's just like some things that are very hard to give a type system that can be described through like a graphical interface, but they actually make a lot of sense over the course of a conversation, right? And should you be using that other interface? Remember I brought up that virtual assistant kind of metaphor earlier? Like if you can have yeah. your assistant do it for you, like, do you even want to be in there and messing with that stuff? Like, if you get the outcome you want, do you want a tool? You know what I mean? So there's a question there, I think, too, that's not has not been on the table, like, in a, in a long time, you know? Yeah, you think that's yeah. Too, too and I mean, far, too future-facing? No. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, this is a conversation that, like, we're, we're having also internally at Numi is, like, a question about, like, okay, it's clear that AI is going to play some role in, in how this thing operates how it functions um yes of course there's like questions around like like levering up designers with ai but there's this other like pretty central question i think in in our mind which is just like how much can we use ai to basically bring structure to a collaboration or to like a customer new me point of contact right uh that doesn't require a human on both sides of the of the interaction like, yeah. and I think that that goes back to what you're asking about of like, yeah, should, should that be the, the place? Is it too futuristic? But I feel like at the pace that things are evolving, it may not be all that futuristic, like pretty soon. Yeah. You could blur the line too, between, you know, what humans are doing in the background versus what you know, AI is doing too. Because like, again, yeah. people who are hiring designers, they don't want to go Like if, if someone exactly. could do one round of a logo or something and you loved it, sold like you're done you know what i mean like it doesn't usually fun fact most logos yeah (laughs) (laughs) most logos and us designers we all know it was the first iteration of begin with you know (laughs) it's true it's really true then we show the client like 10 and we're like look at this crazy pepsi exploration with like you know (laughs) you know yeah we all know there's a lot of psychology (laughs) in that too because people you know like you're it's like remember like why do i keep bringing up steve jobs anyway People, when they were presenting to Steve Jobs, they knew they had to give him multiple options and they would very right. like, you know, uh, precisely like give him one, which was the expected one, two, which was like an alternative and three, which is like outside that, but it's the one they really wanted him to pick. And he would, it, it would make him kind of select the third one because it was like, a like, well, you want me to go here, but I'm going to go here or whatever, like contrarian sort of a thing, you know? <laughs> That's all psychology. Like they had three options. Like if you were, you know, if you had a, if you picked at random, like, you know, it'd be a very different experience than a human. So there's a lot of irrational, you know, funky stuff with that. So maybe that's so, an example, fo- but yeah. <laughs> follow up, follow up question then for, for someone who really like, it sounds like you're, you're thinking pretty deeply about this stuff. What's your response uh, to people who believe that um, AI will automate the function of design? Um, out of existence i mean we have to call out that it's been shocking that like the first great use cases for it have been creative like very human centric things like content creation you know creative writing that, that, hallucinations which are like sometimes a bad thing if it's like customer service like you don't want to give a wrong answer or, you know imagine it's like a medical thing even worse you could like you know <laughs> yeah harm somebody. but uh, the plungers I mean, to the left like i'm asking what to put on my cut <laughs> yeah you don't want a hallucination there but but everywhere else a hallucination is like a is a is a feature right? it's like that's what jasper ai is it like helps you hallucinate things you wouldn't have thought of and same thing with you know mid journey and you know um like all these new video apps coming out like it's doing a really great job at like creative work and it's still you know early and it requires curation and guidance and steering from humans um, but it's pretty darn good. And like, it happened pretty fast. And that was shocking, right? Cause the, you'd think the first thing computers would be good at would be like 
the data entry stuff and the workflow stuff, yeah. you know? But um, so I would say like, we need to pay attention for sure because it's hitting us where we live like pretty fast. Um, you know, apart from the kind of copyright and all those other concerns that are happening for artists and protecting your work and stuff, I, I'm a big proponent of like, get in there and use those tools. Like we're in the co-pilot phase now and you can definitely, yeah. you know, use them to cut your workload down, get more creative. Um, you don't want to be, you know, left like not knowing how to use these tools. But I would also say too, like um, the hope of all this, like, because I do think you're right. Like th there will be some amount of the work of designers that will become possible with AI, right? Um, what happens is just like with other kinds of work, you, you kind of move up upstream. So instead of, you know, the grunt work of doing a hundred ver variations of a certain logo, you're, you're coming up with a strategy of what it should be. It's like prompt engineering is what that is now, but in the future, like, it's like, why are you doing it? What's the story around it? Like, um, how do you, the psycho psychological stuff with like interacting with a client or a customer, that's gonna, gonna be the human thing for, we're talking like 10 years out on that stuff, you know? And honestly, yeah. planning beyond 10 years in tech, you might as well, like, maybe you should become an investor if you're good at that, because then you can make a lot of money. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of you us, know what I was going to say to your point. I, I was going to say, that's really funny. <laughs> I was going to say to your point, I think it was at FigCon uh, recently where they introduced, um, well, let me back up. It, this idea, this notion that you're talking about where it's like getting, getting designers closer to the outcome versus spending a lot of time in the inputs to get that outcome and one example that i have is like at fitcon i think they released like one of the most boring things that i've had to do in my career is like make different on off states or like hover states or any of that jazz lockups whatever and so now you can just tell ai hey here's this button make it in all states make it with coupled states make it with and like that i see that and then I hear designers talking about like AI is going to replace me and they're scared. I'm just like, no, AI gets you closer to your imagination than ever before. That's what AI really does for designers. D designers are always going to be around. Like QA is the last job ever. Like designers are going to be around for a very, very long time. You know, I think so that's, my, know, that's my take on it. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. And like, remember that like, you know, designers are there are a lot of things but i guess this is my personal definition is problem solving you know like that's that's the key function it's like communication and problem solving right okay so like let's say you know the the way we solve these problems changes the tools we use change we're still going to have problems to solve like that's part of what be, what being human is is like the imperfection and the sort of struggle and yeah. adversity we all face that you know like is part of life right um, and also just the idea that there's ever an end point, like think about science, like we don't even know how our brains work. Like, and I know we have like neural networks and all these things, but those are like, they're inspired by like, you know, like neuroscience, yeah. you know what I mean? But even the most advanced people, like certain like things in physics or exploring the ocean, like these are like, there's so much wonder and beauty. And every time we get a layer deeper, there's a hundred more below it. You know what I mean? So right. the idea that that curiosity and that human sort of majesty like goes away in my mind is ridiculous and certainly not going to happen in our lifetimes you know um so until the singularity comes and they just like exterminate us or whatever like i'm feeling good you know? <laughs> yeah yeah i and that's that's also my intuition on it too is that like because design at its core is actually problem solving and like one of the ways in which the solutions get articulated is visual artifacts like sort of pixel render artifacts of here's what the solution is the actual process of doing that rendering is not the central defining thing that makes the designer the designer it is that like mapping the the mapping of the spirit to the pixel that like you know that's a distillation process and yeah you're totally right that uh if you automate out all of the human work in in that process like you just have automated all of the human like the the humans in the entire process all the way up to like you know talking to customers what's your company going to be what's the vision right like 
yeah. robots can't define that right <laughs> like and yeah design i think is going to get more and more in that territory rather than like uh figuring out the uh the pixels for like the drop shadow right let's say yeah and also remember too humans invest in stories like that's how we kind of cognitively understand the world and that's why we we value art right it's like it's not really the the paint on the canvas it's the why that happened the artist's life that inspires the thing it's the the story the art gallery owner like sells you when you like are deciding how much the things work it's the status of owning the thing and what that means to you and your social circle like all that Absolutely. stuff has very little to do with like the painter like putting applying the paint or selecting from That's the art store example. you know what i mean like and so yeah like we we already have like I mean I don't know have you all been playing with Mid Journey like it's amazing it's so fun like uh, yeah to just mm -hmm. dream up something and get a version of it and then play with it and see what iterations can happen and stuff like it's you know like it's gonna be those stories that make things unique or desirable like in other humans' eyes so I think that like the the you know this is a big plug for storytelling like. I believe that was always a part of design, but like it's an even bigger part now with these other kind of tools taking over pieces of the workflow, you know? What do you think? Does that make sense? It, it totally makes sense. I think like, you know, when, well, let's, let's back up that we were, we were, um, we had the pleasure of, uh, uh, speaking with, uh, Zatij and he's like this really, really talented young designer. Uh, from Canada and he was uh, he posted a story once on his Insta and he was in mid journey just messing around with like these different Nike shoes mm. and I remember thinking to myself holy shit if those shoes got sold I'd snatch those things up faster than they could take my money right because what what AI like allows you to do is basically just press fast forward. I, I probably sound like a broken record, but it just allows you to get to your creativity faster. Yeah. It just allows you to press fast forward. Like why would anyone it, outside of the therapy, right? Of like, you know, pixel fucking all day. Like who is going to spend hours, yeah, literally hours doing that when they could just press go after a prompt that they really gave a lot of consideration to in maybe one eighth of the time. I, I really wonder about this for like new generations, like, you know, um, you know, kids growing up right now that will have, you can speak in any voice, you can speak in any language, you can, you know, summarize things, you can have things be written for you. Like, what is that going to do to the, the, the idea of being a maker? Like, you know, for kids who are just being Whoa. born now, like, what are they going to, they're going to have, like, they're definitely going to have a different concept than we do of, like, what it means to create and why you should even do so. Um, and what they yeah. do for fun, like, with creativity, like, it's going to be so different, you know? I'm fascinated by that. I don't I don't have an answer, are, by the way. Are you almost saying, like, it, it's almost like uh, they might get, like, one side is, like, I'm discouraged, like, everything's just, like, I can't be unique, or the opposite side, which is, holy cow, like... I can be as unique as I would like. Yeah. Your guess is good. I mean, they're probably going to be both kinds of people, but like, think about it like this. Like, um, we need an ask an investor who can see 10 years out. So we need <laughs> that. And then introduce me. Um, yeah. Like think about digital natives, right? Like they grew up in a world where like people who grew up with iPhone, like in the world, right? Like that's a very different concept of like how information is available. I, I I'm old enough to remember like, you know, being at, um, you know, being in some conversation where you couldn't think of like a fact and you just didn't get to know, like you just had to, <laughs> maybe you'd look it up in an encyclopedia later or something, or talk to somebody who knew, but now you can like, just look that up and that changes our entire way of looking at the world. And if you grew up with that, it's just going to be such a different paradigm for you. So like apply that to being a maker, like think about Canva, right? Like um right. you know or, or just like i can like kids are doing these story books or whatever with with natural language and like have you seen this like you know um yes. chat gpt can do a great job so um my protagonist is an elephant and you're running away from the zoo and the, the whatever you know what i mean like just right kind of, right you probably doesn't say protagonist but everything else you could get yeah um and then and then chat gpt creates a whole bedtime story about that thing right like what is that like that? So that kid's growing up knowing that like stories can for them personally can just be created 
and they didn't have to do it like oh, yeah. what does that change about their the muscles of creativity essentially like within you you know and then it's almost like taking a step further uh we have a, a buddy uh julian who we also brought onto the show uh but he was telling me about uh his i think it was him anyway i heard about this story where someone was writing like a, a quick short like a like a think like a pixar animation short or something before like the actual feature and they asked it to end to end write a screenplay uh now visualize that screenplay for mid journey and yeah. one by one they were able to create keyframes for the entire movie like i'm getting wow. goosebumps they yeah. were able to like create keyframes for the entire story beautifully represented and the entire production crew is like i can immediately grasp this this is very attainable i mean that that's wild all these like yeah. micro interactions of getting to creativity faster yeah it's like bonkers yeah, yeah. and I, I like i that's what i think about like when i think of how everything's going to get impacted by this is less so uh zero sum like there's only so much work to be done uh, uh on planet earth you know and, and so if robots take some of it we're we're gonna have less work to do and more like yeah, thinking about like the timeline from uh, somebody having an idea for a screenplay to uh, the stage crew knowing how things are supposed to go down and, and what the scenes are supposed to look like. That whole process, if you can just accelerate it, suddenly now the designer is actually so much more productive, right? Yeah. And uh, there's a, probably also like a lot less um, like politicking or convincing that they have to do yes. to get the resources they need to communicate the idea in the first place to give that idea a shot right so man more time for things that matter like yeah. customer interviews looking into data yes. working with engineers for handoff like so yeah. much more meaning goes into their work when they can hit that button and just run with it and there's more content created frankly i mean that's the big thing too with ai they're already like in their deep fakes now and all this stuff it's like um it's a it's a diversity thing too right it like really levels the playing field you know you're talking about the the pixar you know um like storyboard pretty soon you'll be able to use natural language to do like full-on live action scenes they're already using it for like backgrounds oh, yeah. in, in hollywood and stuff you know there's a plugin um, that i think just came out for chat gpt and I, I did send it to julian and it basically just makes you a movie script it's terrible and it uses stock footage but that's where we are that still. concept is there yeah, I yeah. Think it's a matter of time. The, the clock is, you know, ticking toward that outcome. You know what I mean? But so what does it yeah. mean when there's, and this this already happened. It's like it used to be only, you know, um, you know, uh, mainstream TV stations that held all the power and the main record labels, like, you know what I mean? And, and then mm -hmm. what do you do when like everyone can publish a song on Spotify and YouTube and whatever? It changed everything about like the way we interact with content and it becomes more about curation by the way think about that thing like how many kids grow up like you know like showing the world like them learning guitar or piano or singing or something or you know yeah. being a youtube creator like that didn't exist like when i was growing up and what does that do to like the culture and like the social behaviors and norms of, of all these you know people and i think it's fascinating and like so yeah so the, the even though there will be still plenty of stuff for us to do we do have to get used to a world where there's way more noise and content and finding the things you like becomes a really big skill you, you brought up a really good uh good point that um well you know when you go to a party now and like one of like the within the first few sentences it's like oh i saw that in your story Oh, wow yeah oh i oh like i saw i yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah. like literally this beautiful blend from uh the digital world into the creative or it, sorry not into the real world which hopefully is creative but like it's like the digital world going into real life yeah. and there's already so much conversation saved so that you can dive into the more meaty stuff about that person yes. or their life or that stuff it's like oh i already know you went on vacation oh right. i already know you lost your job and you went through turmoil Whoa. or i already know like x y and z and now it's like now we're in person yeah. what are we gonna talk about yeah. You know, you have all this context that was just like derived from like the digital space. And yeah, it's very interesting. Very interesting to think about. You got it. I had a situation the other day where someone I really respected, you know, um, like I saw in person for the first time. I lived in San Diego. And I didn't, didn't even know this person was down here. And they just walked into the co-working space where I was at. It was like, oh my goodness, like, it's so crazy you're here. And then I remembered that like, 
what I've seen from him on social media lately is he had a battle with cancer that like was oh, very wow. serious. And it was this kind of moment where, you know, it was very easy to be, um, you know, like uh, passionate about his work and stuff. But like, you know, as we were leaving, I had to go and it was like, you know, the end of the thing. And I wanted to acknowledge that, but I also didn't want to like, you know, make it seem trivial or something too. So I just said like, I hope we get a chance to talk in future about, you know, all the things that you've been through in the last couple of years, because, you know, I just really love to hear like, you know, how that's been and how you're doing now. And it was like, yeah, that's it. Right. I mean, but like you're talking about like turning up the dial on like the intensity of that. It's not like a vacation. It's like, wow, you almost died. And like, you know, shared pieces of it with the world. And now we can have a different conversation, but and also just the awkwardness of social interactions when you know that much about somebody, but you're not super Internet connected. Self, <laughs> it, you know, influencer self is going away, which I really like. Like there, it, when, when, when socials begin to like pick up steam, there was very much like two personalities. There was like your true self in RL real life. And then there is like, the perceived self like how do i want to showcase these 12 year olds right now they're on some other shit right like they're just built different they're like live streaming them like screaming at their boss telling them that i'm gonna quit no. I'm doing like the fucking loud challenge like smoking a blunt in the elevator i'm like yeah yo this is like <laughs> this is like a lot yeah, right we now have a, like we've had a president it's a reality tv show host and like, yeah I mean, like yeah. No, nothing is like makes sense like in that context yeah. right i mean it is it's yeah. bonkers and you know i mean we're already here like we're already living in that world we're describing so like we right. have to make sense of it and find our way through it and maybe maybe designers can help that'd be my hope is that we can you know at least we can guide like toward quality like i was talking about it's like mm -hmm. here's here's a curation here's my view of the world that helps make sense of it and feels a little more grounded you know that's what we look for a lot in like people that we follow these days is like ideas that kind of calm us and ground us in all this chaos going on you know um, have you found an idea that calmed and ground you in in the midst of the chaos recently like like I said, yeah, it's like um, following people who have really strong opinions about things or that I admire. Like, honestly, too, have you ever just these days stumbled on an artist for the first time you hadn't seen before? Like, it could be like an NFT thing or it could be like a painter or something. And you just kind of do that thing in, in design, like a deep dive where you just kind of live in their world yeah. for a minute and you kind of obsess about them and kind of maybe that's music for you or something else, too. But like. I don't know. I think that that's like a beautiful interaction that feeds your own creativity and inspiration, you know? And I think that that's totally. very calming. It's like, I'm just going to stick with this one thing like right now and kind of live there for a minute and really appreciate like what that's like. And hopefully you can spend time in your own world like that too. Right. But, um, but I find that calming because it's like a little bit of the, you know, inspiration and freshness of a perspective that's not yours, but it's not like the, onslaught of the entirety of the internet coming at you you know an infinite you know text yeah. box that will tell you everything you can dream of and make up new stuff <laughs> yeah yeah while well, hallucinating i was right. watching recently like this kobe Bryant interview and uh either the 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 topic of taylor swift got brought up and like upon first pass you would never assume that like kobe Bryant listens to taylor swift right but the interviewer asked like something along the lines of like why do you listen to her or like you know it doesn't seem like music he'd be interested in he was like he just paused for a moment he was like well i typically am attracted to the greats so if like there's a great and i was just like that's it this is about to go in and so it was just yeah. like this attraction of personalities and he's like you know i don't have to like her music but i'm gonna listen to it because this woman has touched millions decamillions right like crazy yeah. amounts of people why how does she do it how does she break it down what are her lyrics like it's the same thing with like a violin maker or he gave some other examples he's like i just want to meet all the different greats because yeah. they have something to they yeah. have something to offer the world they have something to offer me that i can learn from and i was like that's really nice so anyway i was just wanting to bring that up because of your uh, attraction to you know people and your oh, response yeah. to quality yeah you know i did another grounding thing like on the same tip is like um like a month ago went i decided i had been kind of binging like netflix shows that i didn't even really like and i was like what's going on here like it's just too easy you know and it's like a bit of escapism and um you know there's some some benefits to it i'm sure but like i decided to just like not 
consume any video coming at me, right? And the goal was to try to see like what curiosity surfaced, just kind of out of boredom almost, you know what I mean? And then a hundred percent me seeking them out versus Whoa. them coming at me. And that was like right. mind blowing because it was like we're just so attuned to like trying to keep up with everything. Like think about AI, like every day goes by and some new thing happens and Microsoft and everyone's warring over whatever. And you know, like this might impact your job. So what came, what came up for you? Oh, man, it was, um, number one was just the idea of taking time to think through my own stuff, like really strategize. Like I, I'm, you know, I'm at Zapier as on the AI R and D team, but I'm also dreaming up like what my next startup is going to be. Um, and it's been challenging. As one should. What's that? <laughs> I said, as one should. As one should. <laughs> you know, entrepreneurs. Um, <laughs> founders going to founder. Um, yeah, like, you know, it's a big space to work on. And it's, you know, uh, it's hard to zero in on like a domain or, you know, a specific niche to kind of start in with AI. I know I want it to be within AI because I think that's just like the big paradigm shift happening and the, the big opportunity right. to be gained. I know it's just, I'm just passionate about it and excited about it, you know? But whether that's like a creative tool for designers, whether that's music thing, whether that's enterprise SaaS, because I've done startups, you know, in that world before too. Like, I don't know. And I've been kind of, you know, um, on autopilot a little bit. So that, you know, cold turkey video, no video consumption thing helped me just go, okay, I'm just going to sit here. Like, you know, when you're a kid and you kind of like wow. sit down and you watch the treetops or something and just like watch the wind. Yeah, blow by. yeah. You have that moment as an adult and you're like, Oh my God, like I never do this. Like I never allow yeah, myself. And it's like just... so special, right? Yeah. It's poetic and you know, it brings you into the moment, which is just such a grounding. So yeah, that was incredibly yeah. relaxing, you know? And it's and it's just like right there every day, that. all yep. day, yep. just waiting for you to tap into it. And it's just a matter of choice, right? Whether you do it or not. Um, five minutes yeah, is very, is very enough, powerful, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you just like you're like, wow, I whoa okay and then right. counting how many times you think like to grab your phone and you just actually don't need to i think there's this crazy statistic out there that it was like four out of the nine times that you reach for your phone you're going to a meta service a what, meta service whatsapp facebook yeah or like, oh uh, whoa. Sure. Instagram. Okay. it's like now threads yeah but i'm like That's what if I, I do want to try this exercise that you just said, though, like maybe just cutting out these video services and just thinking about what happens when I just rest my mind, when mm. I want to do something that is maybe an escape or something, you know, yep. like doom scroll or like binge or something. So I love that. Yeah. And I, I just also want the other thing too. just reading. Like I, I yeah. got caught up on reading. I was reading movie scripts because I've been kind of dabbling at like you know, script writing or whatever. And I was like, you know, I was very quick to like start watching the movie right away, kind of kind of compare to the script. And I was like, yeah, I can do mm -hmm. that next month. Like it's, it's not, I'm not even going to notice like Whoa. a month, a week go by, you know what I mean? And so yeah, I just yeah, really yeah. sat with that and I read like four movie scripts or whatever that month and just kind of learned a lot about like the process of that side of it. So, and that's a different experience though, because you're really choosing like, I want to read the script for this movie or this book that I've been wanting to read, you know? And it's very mm -hmm. much you choosing your path instead of the world informing you. Yeah, it's like thrown. What were you say? No, no, no. It's okay. No, I, I would actually like. Uh, I was gonna say as you're like thinking through what like the the next startup might be. Something hit me yesterday when I was talking with um some friends of mine who were like they're like super super technical. They're like engineers, engineers, right? Um, they really know their stuff. And I was telling them about some things that we had on our roadmap at Numi and uh, the role that AI was going to play in, in some of them. And they pointed something out to me that I realized is probably happening to a lot of people right now. And I don't know if it's it's been happening to you, where I was telling them about like basically like a way that we wanted to um, to do like matchmaking powered by AI. And they mm. said, you know, some of the stuff that you're describing doesn't actually sound like it needs AI. It sounds like you could do it with like a pretty like meat, meat and potatoes database. And I realized, I actually realized that literally the the way that AI has blown up was actually like stretching my imagination mm. um, in in a way that we last saw actually when like Ethereum really arrived on the scene sure. in 2017. 
right? And ICOs. And suddenly Harris and I started talking about, well, what's our next startup going to be? What are we going to do? And that turned into Numi. It has to be on the blockchain. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And fun fact, <laughs> fun, fun fact for like, you know, uh, the, the startup history geeks out there, I believe Lambda School, now known as Bloom Tech, uh, they originally, when they went to YC, they believed that they were going to be securitizing the income share agreements on Ethereum. Mm. And their group partners were like, what does Ethereum have anything to do with this? If you teach somebody how to code and figure out how to get them to pay like 30 grand over the course of a few years, like, you know, blockchain or no blockchain, that's an interesting business. Or I think one example that just came to mind is we were doing some like group, group office hours um, mm. with, um, with, uh, with, some, with some really talented founders. And uh, one of them... It was like a decentralized kind of. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A decentralized front end, right? That's more what? secure and it's unstoppable and it's powered by AI. And then um, we were like, okay, well, what are your customers describing you as? And <laughs> because that's what any. you should go. That should, be the, that should be the copy on your website. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, oh, well, we're super fast. I'm like, are they mentioning the decentralization? And he's like, oh, no, none of them mentioned they it. It's like, no. Start marketing the, yeah. the speed, you know? Right. It's so true. So it's like almost like unlocking it. Yeah. No, it's, it, there's two elements here. Like one is it's really fun to watch, you know, traditional engineers who are top of their game, like amazing, you know, um, who do algorithms and database, everything, full stack. Like watch them struggle with like LLMs because they're just like, it's like an unruly child. Like so it'll give you different answers yeah, based yeah, on yeah. what words you say to it and like, you never know like what's going to happen and trying to put that in production is like uh, baffling, you know? Um, but yeah, like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't really have any like, you know, strong opinions on that one, to be honest, but I don't know. What, what do you think? I mean, I don't know. I think that like, uh, that this is something that happens with like big arrivals of technologies is that they seem to stretch and expand the imaginations of everybody who's paying attention yeah and they may think that they're like oh i gotta find the new solution or the new application for this technology but there's a subconscious process happening under the hood yeah. which is just like the technology is causing them to think about the problems that they're encountering in their day-to-day -day or that they they know about that they might be able to do something about and it may actually turn out that the most effective or efficient solution has nothing to do with the technology that inspired their thinking in You're the first totally place, right. which is You're okay right. and good. I think it's right. You have a strong like, opinion. So yeah, like oh, okay. <laughs> these are tools, right? Tools to achieve a certain end. And like, I, I will say like, it, it matters. This is something I learned from Zapier. Like it matters because everyone always asks Zapier, like what tools should I use? What SaaS app should be my CRM and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter as much as the fact that like you adopt it and like everyone in the team uses that CRM, for instance, you know what I mean? Right. Um, it matters a lot less than you think, like what tools you use, but a hundred percent as a, as a VC, cause it, you know, you asked a while back what was next for me after, after that. Like, I got pulled into VC mm -hmm. kind of investing in underrepresented founders. So diversity, equity, mm -hmm. inclusion, plus investment, right? Um, as an investor, I see people assigning the wrong tool for like a problem all the time. Just like you said, like it's a blockchain thing, but it really doesn't add any value to the to the the solution for users. And users don't care. Like you could, you know, they don't they don't. Most of the time, people don't care. Like what stack tech stack you're using? Is it TypeScript or is it PHP? Like they don't care as long as it gives them what they want. But um, but I see all the time founders kind of go like they become enamored with a thing and. The problem is sometimes that works. Sometimes like the Ethereum stuff you're all were messing with, like might've been a really big deal because like something new opens up and all these possibilities happen and you just, it's really hard to choose like what's going to take off and kind of click. And if you were there and, you know, innovating on that at the same time, you could be that hit, you know, you could be that unicorn or whatever it is, you know, or whatever we're on now, dodecacorn or something <laughs> yeah yeah dodecacorn i, I, I yeah. mean we like to subscribe to uh being a cockroach yep. just absolutely unkillable yep. um yeah so maybe there's a deck of cockroaches yeah. out there. but in, in the spirit of beating a dead horse apple when they released their ipad okay they had no idea what its use case would be mm. they had no understanding and a lot of the product team was um really fighting the leadership team because and these are all rumors so take it with a grain of salt but like 
it's probably real um but like they, <laughs> the they, small they were like they were like they were the leadership did not have uh, uh a way to sell it to the public the marketing team was also really upset because they felt like this was just uh, a, a bigger iphone like what's the differentiation mm -hmm. and they started uh they started selling it it went into production yada 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 they found that to sell it was actually to not have a purpose it's to find the purpose so the way that they started marketing and if you were to go back in time you could see the same messaging it was mm. like make a purpose for it and so they started releasing all these ads of these use cases that you would never even imagine right like one of the first ads i think was showcasing how firefighters now can view an entire typographical map oh. in like this big yeah. versus something this small or even worse a paper map that they're in a high stress situation yeah. and they're having to like fucking like fold up like a, you know a 17 panel sheet of paper it's like mm -hmm. no ipad zoom over here's the fire yeah. here's where it our sensors are so that, that that's talking to yeah. the ipad right and like teachers then began to yeah. expand on it musicians began to yeah. expand on it and so the ipads like became something where it is a device that unlocks yeah. versus being a device that prescribes you know i th i think i think that's beautiful I, i'm you know deeply fascinated with that too like i've always loved iPads and struggled to like work them into my like daily workflow kind of you know yeah and i have one like where, where did it go i lost it anyway i have one right here but it's uh, and i have two actually i have like one of the mini ones from a couple of years ago and a newer pro one but like it's so tied to that form factor and you know there were a whole bunch of you know startups that kind of got excited about that just like in the early you know iphone like app store stuff you know and they made like ipad yeah. specific apps they didn't take off though like that was the the so mm -hmm. it almost kind of breaks my designer heart that like it hasn't found its place except for in like in the field kind of tablet use or whatever which a lot of times you don't need an apple device for that a lot of times people will just get cheaper ones you know what i mean it's just a convenience right. of a bigger screen, you know? Well, and I think one of the reasons why the iPad was able to do that, and this, I, it reminds me of what you were talking about of Zapier with like the, the template generated pages, mm. even before they had a fully fleshed out product, is one huge change that's come in my thinking about how startups like work or how they're built um, in the last year is I used to think of building as like writing code um, and and the technology that you built as the artifacts of the product, right? Mm. The process like of building the product was writing code. Now I'm seeing actually that building happens on both sides of writing the code and talking to customers yeah. because talking to customers actually like what Zapier was doing was essentially building a set of relationships and like harvesting more and more of a nebula of curious demand, you know, that like the one in a hundred particles that would like pop and be ready to like actually like pull out their credit card information. Zapier was going to make sure that they had the hundred particles necessary to find that one a thousand, a thousand, a thousand times over. And I feel like it's the same thing with the iPad. Yeah, totally. They had such a massive audience yeah. that like, you're like saying, you love the iPad, don't know how to work it into your workflow. But like, for you, it's probably I'm the same yeah. way, by the way. Really? Me too. I've, I've bought like every new like seismic changed uh, iPad. I'm like, what the fuck am I going to use this for? Yeah. I still can't replace my laptop. Nope. I can't run Figma on it. So it's what do you like, end up watching your videos on too? Like, I end up watching on my phone, you know? I even have like the little, like, yeah. uh, oh, little quick stand. So that I can, are there? Yeah. Oh, so yeah, like at yeah. lunch, if I can yeah. like watch yeah. my thing, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> even though I have a bigger yeah, I try screen, to do better it. quality and, uh, you know. I don't know. I, I do try to do it with the iPad. I think that the one thing that would be such a killer use case for the iPad that is like, man, they just need to get this right, is if they could figure out how to have like a camera, not um on the uh the 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 slim side, you know, middle, but on the wide side middle, so that like the natural use case is that you have it set up with the magic keyboard yeah. and then you've got right like yes. the camera right that is really where weird. it is on a laptop i agree yeah instead of like off to the left and so it's like every every camera shot that i, yeah. I take or like you know facetime from the ipad it's always like i'm over that here, is a really right weird rather choice. than 100 percent agree i remember i forgot the reason i bought my iPad was because my laptop died and there was a moment where like i didn't mm. and i was like oh i guess this is an opportunity to, to get that iPad. this was like because i needed a, like a temp computer essentially you know i didn't want to buy like a whole new MacBook Pro, like for a couple weeks or whatever, you know what I mean? 
So that was why I did it. And I was using it a hundred percent of the time, including like Figma design and um, Zoom calls and whatever. And like, you're totally right about that video thing. I remember being so awkward. And if you wanted to like look <laughs> in the person's eyes, then you can't see them. And so you're doing this weird, like I'm looking at the <laughs> yeah, screen or whatever. It's so weird. Yeah. That's an and now problem. they have, they have like these two features. Uh, so it's funny that you guys bring this up. They have two features. One is a silent and one's known. The silent one is uh, it auto corrects your eyes. What? So mm. Auto correct your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's a thing. The second thing huh. is that uh, in the control center, the top right, you can do, I think, let's pull it up right now. I think it's called uh, center stage. And it will automatically zoom in a bit. And then Ken burns you. Oh, in yeah. A really no. move way. Or whatever. And it follows you. Yeah. But I think it's nauseating. Yeah. I, I like tell that. designers to turn it's it off moving. when they're talking to clients. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Cool idea. So, but just wow. By the way, does every design podcast evolve into like an Apple podcast? <laughs> I, yeah, I, feel like... I, I think it's inevitable. <laughs> it's inevitable. But so, okay, Brian, I have, I have one. Uh, one final question for you, which is just, mm. what is your what is your parting piece of advice to a designer who who is now where you were, let's say fifteen, maybe maybe like sixteen years ago? Mm. And same thing, what's that one piece of advice that you have to a founder who's who's in a similar spot? Yeah, I mean, they're going to be the same answer, which is you know, really follow your curiosity because you know, if you're if you're someone who sees quality like attracted towards others kind of who also value quality you will find your way to something cool that's a little bit nebulous i realize but like if you look back at all those things we talked about exactly with pinterest my own startup startup studio venture capital they all are led by that and very serendipitous it's a very terrible like humble brag of mine is i've never applied to a job like I've, i've never like um Someone asked me for a resume the other day, and I was like, I don't know why they asked, by the way. It had nothing to do with anything, but I was like, <laughs> honestly, I just don't, I don't really have one. Like, I've never, you know, a portfolio, but I've never had, like, a resume, you know? So, follow your curiosity. Do the work. Like, you have to actually, like, get, get good at things, right? So, stay long enough to, like, get, you know, excel, like, within a particular skill set. Um, and then, like, what we were talking about, the core designer, like, trait in my mind the best ones are empathetic right user-centered design human-centered design um customer development like always talking to your users for for your uh, make something users want is like the yc slogan right Um, yeah yeah that's it like if you can follow your curiosity and care about what others need and think and desire you'll find something magical like in the the intersection that i think can be you know whatever you dream of whether that's a small business or a unicorn or just a side project that you're passionate about. But it la- the other thing I want to say last is that like, we are at this like paradigm shift with AI. Like I think it's sort of unanimously, you know, seen this way now. And no, no one out there knows what the hell we're doing. Like I do this every day at a company that's like, you know, like AI is a pretty big deal to, and we're like, like children at a playground, like trying to figure this stuff out, you know? Um, so like now is the time to get in there. Like you could be one of the ones deciding what that new UX is or thinking of how we interact with computers in this new way or what it means to designers to, to have parts of your workflow automated for you that like free you up to do, you know, talk to customers or do something else creative or problem solving, you know? Um, so be that person who's like curious about it at a minimum and then experimental like even better like get your feet wet with like these new tools and um even if you have to kind of carve out a little like nights and weekends time or something like yeah be on that side of it and not kind of you know like on the laggard side if you will you know in terms of technology adoption so that'd be my my advice for sure is curiosity follow the quality and then you know get in there <laughs> play be curious <laughs> yeah yeah a hundred percent brian this has been seriously such an awesome chat like we'd love to have you on again thank you so much for taking the time and like i feel like uh i i know all of our designers watch this and they're gonna get a hoot out of this and a lot of founders are also gonna get a lot of value out of this so thank you really i really appreciate you both i love what you're up to with new me so i'm excited to be a customer at some point and I'll, you know help out however i can so um and if you meet that investor who can see 10 years in the future let me know because i want to 
follow along. Yeah, we will. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll let you know too. Out. Yeah, we'll we'll all be LPs in their fund, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> exactly. All right, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Brian.